Welcome to Film Forum Presents, a podcast featuring special live events recorded at our theater located at 209 West Houston Street in downtown Manhattan. In this episode, Film Forum presents Nancy Schwartzman, director of Roll Red Roll, a new documentary examining the Steubenville, Ohio sexual assault case. Schwartzman appeared on opening night, March 22nd, 2019, for a panel entitled, How Can Men Challenge Rape Culture? with the activist and former NFL player Wade Davis and Mark Pagan, a comedian, writer, and producer of the podcast, Other Men Need Help. The panel was moderated by writer Lena Wilson, who covered the film for Slate. Roll Red Roll is now playing through Thursday, April 4th. Hi, everyone. Uh, Welcome to Film Forum. We are so proud to present the U.S. theatrical premiere of Roll Red Roll, directed by Nancy Schwartzman. Uh, The film had its world premiere at last year's Tribeca Film Festival. It opened today to uniformly positive reviews for its incisive treatment of the complexities of the Steubenville, Ohio rape case. The New Yorker's Anthony Lane calls it raw and pressing, all the more potently wrathful for being so restrained. This is Nancy's feature debut. She is also an activist who has developed technology to build safer communities for women and girls, like the Circle of Six Safety app. Uh, Tonight, after the film, stick around because we have a special post-screening panel to discuss the film with Nancy on the theme of how can men challenge rape culture. Tonight's guests include former pro football player and the NFL's first LGBTQ inclusion consultant, Wade Davis and the producer and the host of the podcast, Other Men Need Help, Mark Pagan. The discussion will be moderated by Lena Wilson, a culture critic who reviewed the film in Slate and also has bylines in Bitch Magazine and The Playlist. So now, please help me give a warm welcome to Nancy Schwartzman, the director of Roll Red Roll. Wow. Oh my God, it was amazing. Oh my gosh, Uh, I've been coming to film forums since I was like 18 and like eating burritos in the back and like doing all that kind of stuff. So it's such an amazing, amazing honor. Thank you so much for letting us bring our film here and for all of you coming to see it in New York City on the screen for the first time. Um, It's been such a wild day um, with uh, press breaks and everything and it's it's such a good moment to be having this conversation so I am delighted about the panel and really encourage you uh, after all the feelings the film's going to spark up I think the panel is going to give us all some hope because of the amazing people who are going to be speaking with us so thank you so much and um, see you in 80 minutes Hi, everyone. Can we please welcome uh, Nancy Schwartzman, the director of the film? (laughs) Wade Davis, who's also here with us tonight. And then Mark Pagan as well. Uh, I'm going to let everyone sort of do a little quick introduction of themselves, but uh, do we want to just like take a deep breath together before we we get going? Um, Seriously, like. (sighs) All right. I'm Lena Wilson. I'm a culture critic. I had the privilege of reviewing this film in Slate uh, out of Tribeca. So that was just a little under a year ago. And I'm so, uh, so honored to be here for its uh, re-premiere in New York, if you will. I'm Mark Pagan. I'm a producer, filmmaker, educator. Uh, I'm here kind of in the capacity of uh, talking from the work that I'm doing right now on a show called Other Men Need Help, which is a show about the uh, emblems and the habits and the struts and the male performance and really dissecting uh, insecurity and performative masculinity. Hi everyone, I'm Wade Davis. Um, I just want to give Nancy a huge round of applause again. Like. Um, <laughs> Honestly, it's really, um, this is the second time I've seen this film, and each time I'm transformed. Um, I'm Wade Davis. I'm a former NFL player, a consultant for the NFL, for Netflix and Google. Um, yeah. And we all know, we all know you now, but. You know me. 
Um, no, but I'm so excited. Part of, you know, what we want to do with this film is really host these conversations and have these conversations. So I'm so thrilled to share this um, first night with you all with Wade, Mark and Lena um, to really talk about what are some positive, amazing role models uh, around masculinity and what men can do um, to help eradicate this culture. All right. So I have a few questions for them and then we might open it up for a question or two at the end. Our only request from the theater is that once the conversation wraps, uh, we head out so that the next screening can come in. But just to start, Nancy, uh, you're talking about sort of like the role models and what we can take away from this film. And I'm really curious about the messages that you brought into this film as its creator. So there are so many casts of characters to pick from in this town of Steubenville, Ohio. Uh, and you know, you're know, you talking to people who aren't even necessarily involved with the incident directly. How did you choose the people that you did? Um, I also, since we're in our hometown, um, some of the creators of this film are in this audience. So I want to give huge love to Christopher White, who was our editor, and um, Barry Perlman, who was our co-producer. Um, so their names were on the screen, their hearts were in this film, it would not be possible. And Justa Bruin, who's here, has been with us for a really, really long time. Um, Eliza Licht, um, yeah, amazing, amazing people who have to hold up uh, you know, it's not easy work. The story, there were so many points of view to really sift through, both with what was happening online and offline. I knew those, the moment I spoke with Alex Goddard that she was going to be our main character. She had so much conviction, so much intelligence. She's such a great character. She smokes inside. Um, it's like, oh my God, that was perfect. Um, you know, she's amazing. Uh, but I also think it's really important when we talk about whistleblowers, like that's you and me, that's us, that's her, you know, if we if we all have the courage that she had, right? So I love that about her, uh, that she was able to really know something was wrong and also make that distinction between whether it's criminal evidence or actually evidence of a cultural problem. And she made that distinction, whereas the police were like, why would we look at a tweet? You know, why is that important? And she's like, because look at how young men are are speaking and acting. In terms of this conversation, I felt like it was really important to find Sean McGee. He was in the film, like he was in the 12 minute video already and he was sort of standing out as someone who had this really strong moral compass and was saying like, this is not okay. Um, so it felt important for me to kind of lift him out of that video and create more energy around him and show that like, no, there are kids in that room who knew um, something was, was way off. So those are some of the, the people that I was really drawn to in the film. Um, you know, documentary film for the filmmakers in the room, it's like so many no's. It's all the people who said no to us and then like whoever's left you make a film with, basically. <laughs> but we had one film before we got the police files that was really about a town recovering, um, a town rebuilding itself. Um, and then we were gifted the files by Rachel DeSell from The Plain Dealer. And I want to point out how also, there was this beautiful network of women working together, like Alex Goddard, and then Rachel lifted her up, and then the prosecutor was a woman. You know, there was this really interesting network, um, and what Alex was doing with Jane for Jane Doe as well. But um, so Rachel had the prosecution files and gave them to us, and then we were able to really understand the boys, like really get in the police room with them, really look at the text messages, um, and start to craft more of a crime story. I forgot to thank someone who's incredible. I need to thank Chandra Jesse, who's with us, who um, really enabled this film to get made. Um, so I'll say thank you. Um, okay, so that's all I'll say for now. Yeah, I think that you craft this really beautiful narrative of the, the night in question and the people who are sort of revolving around it. Uh, and you see this uh, detective sort of saying, there's this narrative being laid out and there's so many opportunities for someone to say something and to stop this. And so I'm curious, Wade or Mark, whichever of you would want to take this, like how how can boys or men in a situation like this just be like good bystanders? You mean how as far as them them speaking up or how do we um, how do we create them in order to become that? I'm trying to attempt to make that distinction. I mean, I feel like the film is sort of in conversation with both, whatever, whatever you're. Yeah, about. you know, um, so you know, over the last, I would say, four or five years, I've had a chance to work to whether it's it's athletes who are in, in the pros or college or or even in high school. And when you talk to young boys specifically, what they tell you is that 
their parents actually aren't talking to them about consent and sexual assault. You know, I talked to, um, I was just speaking at this uh, boarding school in Massachusetts. And what I learned is that the parents are failing these kids, you know, and there's a, there's a, there's a comment in this film that, that happens over and over again. And we say the things that these are good kids. No, your kids are just human beings. Right. And if, if, if you keep thinking of your kid as a good kid, then, then you don't talk to your kid about sexual assault and sexual harassment and con consent. And your kids will be in a world that these things exist in. So you're actually setting them up for a failure. Right. So at this school, this one kid asked me a very innocent question. He was like, what was it like your first time having sex? The fact that he's asking me that question, right, and is uncomfortable asking their, his parents that question speaks to a level of shame that we have in this country where we're actually not being brave adults to talk to our kids about sex, about porn, about consent. And that's how we're failing these kids. So these kids aren't even given the tools to be able to speak up in that, that moment because every boy knows, you know, that there is this very unspoken agreement that the only way to, to be perceived as a man is through the body of a woman, right? Like it's this unspoken thing that we all know about that no one says, right, but it, it's there. So if, if you're trying to become a man in this world, right, and you don't want to lose the value of your friends ar around you, you don't know how to speak up because your parents haven't taught you the difference between bravado and bravery. And then Mark, I mean, sort of speaking to the work that you're doing on Other Men uh, Need Help, which is a great podcast that you all should listen to, um, it sort of feels almost like this, I mean, I guess where I'm coming at it from is almost this like anthropological project where it's like this inside look at how men speak to each other and interact with each other and how like they perpetuate their roles in society through these like thoughts that they're taught. And so how does your work there sort of inform uh, this sort of like culture change work that we're trying to address tonight? Um, well, I saw this initially at Tribeca and probably like, like a lot of us who are seeing it for the first time tonight, it was really, I mean, there's a lot. I think, you know, and coming here and talking tonight and, and thinking about a lot of these things and doing the show, it's like, it's, it feels empty to say, well, you know, I, I could tell those boys to say, you know, to, to make a ruckus and do all these things. It's very easy for me to do. The catalyst for the show in a lot of ways, and I think the work that I'm doing, is very much just a personal response to call out culture because, because of the disassociation. It's very easy for me to say, and this is true, I'm not a football player, so I won't run into that situation. My friends aren't jocks. I, don't, I personally don't have a lot of friends who are athletes, so it's very easy to say, like, well, they wouldn't do anything like that. I wouldn't do anything like that. And so I think for me, what's, what's been really powerful and... You know, it's it, it becomes so lofty. The things that we we can and cannot do, or feel like we can't do, is is a level of personal accountability. Like to the best that I can, I really kind of I think in some ways echoing what Wade was saying. There is a modeling that just needs to happen with every single man in this room, and a lot of us. I mean, myself, like I'm a New York liberal. It's very easy for me to walk out of here and be like, my life is fine. What am I doing to this system of page? I'm not doing anything. I'm a progressive guy. You know, I did the right things politically and all of this stuff. But there are, there's just the everyday behavior, which I think men have to really fucking analyze, like the little things that we're doing, whether they're microaggressions or just how we're talking culturally, even the work we're sharing. Am I sharing predominantly work by men online and things like that? Like all of these little steps add up to a, a larger thread of things that we are not connecting, I feel like. And so I don't want to use the word making men self-conscious, but I think there's a level of support we can give each other in a dialogue and offer some mentorship and modeling with each other as well as that any, any, any young men that are in our life or that we have access to. So I'll, in disclosure, I'm friends with Chris, so I did think it was a terrific movie, but I wonder, I appreciate what Wade says about t talking about sex, and I'm a father of uh, two teenage boys and a teenage girl, my son is a wrestler and a baseball player, and uh, you know, I don't know if he'll ever reach the pros, probably not, but definitely in that culture. But I wonder what you think about a culture of fear of standing out. He's not afraid to be at the plate in the ninth inning with the tying run at third. He's not afraid of that, and he will do that, but he is deathly afraid of wearing the wrong shirt to school. And he's a, he's a, I mean, fuck you, he is a good kid. <laughs> he is a good kid. And I think I'm also a New York progressive 
But watching this movie, I don't think he'd be Trent. I think that's pathology. Trent is, something's wrong. And that's not culture. Something's wrong there, the, the chemistry or whatever. But I worry even about my own son. Would he be the other? Would he be brave enough? Anyway, I wonder what you think about like just a culture of fear. And I talk about everything we got to talk about. I'll show him this movie. I'll show him whatever. But in the locker room, I don't know what it is. It's easy to make these jokes about girls or you know, boys or whatever. But what do you think about I think it's more fear. Why, like why there wasn't a hero. It's funny. I was thinking just that thought when either the policeman or somebody said, unfortunately, there was no heroes. I was thinking that same thought. Why are there no heroes here? But it's. But then I think of Jesse. I don't know that Jesse would do it. I don't know. What do we have to do to not talk about sex, but just to, to make them not afraid to do the right thing in a huge way like that? The best answer I got is uh, something that James Baldwin says, right, is that... Um, if your kid is looking for validation through the eyes of another, he will never be courageous, right? Right. So how do you teach your kid to love himself, right? If I was to ask you, have you told your kid to love himself, you would say yes. But if I said to you, have you taught him how? It's a very different question, right? Because most kids learn, learn to get their own value through others, it's why kids love the likes of the social media, like, and all of that stuff. The reason why your son won't stand out in a crowd is because he's looking for them to validate him. You haven't taught him how to validate himself, right? And you can't rest in this idea that your kid's a good kid. Every parent in that film would have told you that their kid's a good kid. And none of those good kids said a damn word, right? So be disinterested in thinking of your kid as a good kid. Be more interested in teaching your kid to love himself and be really courageous as a father to, uh, to not rest on this idea that he's good, right? Because good is idiosyncratic. It actually, it actually means nothing. Like, you're, I'm a good person. What the fuck does that mean? It means nothing but what I think it is, right? But that young girl in this movie, she thought Trent was the good kid. She thought all those were good kids. So, so, can, so can, we be, can, can you be more courageous with your son and tell him a time where you weren't as courageous as you wanted to be in, in those moments? Can you be really vulnerable and say, hey, son, here are some times where I did X, Y, and Z, and I should have been better? Because you've got to, as Mark's saying, like you've got to model Model it, but you've also got to be dangerously vulnerable, radically vulnerable, because no one cares if you're a liberal. No one cares if you're a progressive. Everyone in this film would say that, too. We can't be so intellectually dishonest where well, well, we rest in the idea that we're a liberal. Who cares? These young women don't care. One in four women in America will be victims of sexual assault, right? I'm sure someone who raped them, I'm a Democrat. Who cares? Like, the question is, what are you doing to save these people's lives? I'm just, I'm just tired. Like, like if you really do the math, there's so many women in this room who have gone through that, and all that we want to talk about is whether we're a liberal or a Democrat. Like, who cares? Like, the work of a solidarity partner, not, not of as an ally, but someone who walks in solidarity realizes that when you create a world where women and men don't have to deal with rape culture, we all benefit. So can we walk in solidarity, not being some ally, because it benefits us too? And we can't. And we got to just do, do more work, and we got to take risks, and we, and we got to give up something. Like, we got to learn that in order to create a world that's equitable and equal, you've got to give up something. You can't be like, I don't want to do, uh, no, give it up, right? Be, because Nancy gave up something to create this film. Now, what are we willing to give up next? Oh, I want to say something. It's very hard to follow up uh, Wade Davis. Um, but, you know, I think what we're trying to do with this campaign also is elevate uh, voices like Marx and Wade's. But also, we as individuals put a lot of pressure on ourselves to individually solve systemic problems. This is, this is a systemic problem, right? So all the cultural messages, all the kids are getting, that the school administration is reinforcing, like, we, sh we can't expect all parents to be fantastic um, consent-based sex educators, right? We're all coming with our own biases, but you can, as a parent, pressure your school to bring Wade to school. You can, as a parent, <laughs> like, I'm serious, right? I mean, I wish every Show team, the film at school. Yeah, exactly. Obviously show the, f obviously show the film. Um, <laughs> 
bring all of us with really fantastic honoraria and like we'll be there. Um, we will be there. But, you know, like so we as individuals have a shit ton of work to do, but also we can pressure, we can put pressure on our institutions, right? So how can we make sure our coaches are getting an education? Like it can't, we can't just all hinge it on like why are these two people raising this child not doing it perfectly? It's like, of course, it's like a minefield out there and all of our institutions need massive correcting and massive education and you know there's lots of avenues to find that on our website um but but yeah so i think it's like a multi-pronged set of solutions i mean something that i'm curious about wade is i mean you see a case like this and then you see similar cases in other high schools in the country and in college uh colleges where there's an administrative push to protect football programs and the funding that they bring over uh, victims of the assaults of their players. And, you know, you are working with the NFL in initiatives for LGBT inclusion. You were in the NFL as a player. Um, you know, Mark and I are over here like sports. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's it's really easy to say, like, I'm not in that culture. I don't know what that's about. Like, that's this other thing. But, like, you are and you were. So can you offer us some insight into that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm biased. I'm, I'm an athlete, so let me own that, right? Um, but what happens in these cultures, whether it's high school, college, or pros, right, is that you are so interested in the – in the way the other person thinks about you. And as you this and as the question mentioned, like you don't want to be on the outside of the circle because you feel unsafe, right? Like there is a safety in being inside of the circle, right? So one of the challenges is that sports culture, uh, the fraternity culture, anytime you have a group of individuals without any real levels of supervision, right? Um, oftentimes the ugliness of us comes out because we're trying to perform for each other, right? So, and I don't have the answer for that, except um, you've got to work with coaches, you've got to work with parents at young ages that kids grow up really with a deep abounding respect for themselves, that they go, I can exist outside of the circle, I'm going to be okay. Because if you get to, once you get into the NFL, it's too late. You know, like once I was in the NFL and my mother didn't talk to me about this, it was too late. You know, I was already so deeply invested in wanting to be a part of the cool kids crew. It was too late. But thankfully, you know, I grew up some and some and someone, you know, gave me some books by Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde and, and, and Gloria Steinem. And, and, and I realized that, wow, if I create a world that's more equitable, and equitable for women, I win, too. Like that was the lightning bolt that kind of happened to, to me, but it took someone investing much time in me. I don't think to Nancy's point that it's, it's not shocking to me that the women were the ones who spoke up, right? If you think about movements that happen, whether it's the suffrage movement or the Me Too movement, it's the group that's the most marginalized that speaks up because they have to, right? So the question that we have to ask ourselves is when is the group that's in the dominant position going to actually start doing the lion's share of the work but the reason why we don't is because we benefit by it, you know, and, and that's what's unspoken. It's come up a lot and it came up, I mean, like the antiques, the guy at the antique shop and, and the, the post online of like those poor boys. And, you know, Wade, you talked about we have to give up something. And I'm just, I'm trying to kind of get my head around it. I know it's a big question of like, what are we so afraid of in quote unquote, like villainizing boys and men? Like, why do we have to protect the, we put so much emphasis on the boys and making sure they're treated fairly and like what are we admitting or giving up or losing like what are we so afraid of in just saying as as men i guess like that was wrong why do we have to look at like how might it not have been rape how might it have been a mistake um how are they not bad how are they still good kids like what are we so afraid we're going to lose or give up if we recognize that power it's, it sounds like, like a big word, but it's actually very, very simple, right? It, um, if you look at our history, right, um, power is not given, it's taken. You, you, you know, so what we're afraid is to give up our power, you know. Those parents knew that those kids had done something bad. Um, those parents, you know, sports is a business also, 
right? So in that town, the guy said it, right, that the football team is providing an economic engine for that city. So if the boys get in trouble, the football program gets in trouble, and the kids suffer, but the entire, you know, city suffers, right? So it's, you know, it's power at so many different levels, and people are afraid to give that up, you know? And we're living in this space where we, we all live in, like, this mind of scarcity, right, that we're so af afraid, you know, and we deem boys as an asset and women as a deficit, right? So we want to protect the asset in our country, and we've been raised to believe that men are the asset, right? It's, it's, it's why, you know, in history books, we only talk about the work that men have done, so we further entrench this, this idea. So, yeah, if I'm going to protect something, it's the asset. I'd also say that I think there's a fear of an actual discovery of how endemic it is, right? There's like a real, like, I do not want to know how bad it is. I do not want to have to hear she was, she was, he was, da, 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 and it just like ripples out. And I feel like there's just a knee jerk kind of protection. Women do it too, right? Like, I don't want to have to acknowledge this level of victimization that's been going on. And like, I made this film to like shock people essentially to being like, holy shit, like this is our culture. Like Variety, um, the writer today wrote something brilliant. If you guys look it up, it feels like a master's thesis on our culture right now. And it's like this, what he called cultivated sociopathy. Mm. Fucking, that is like an amazing review and I'm gonna quote it all the time in terms of like breaking it down. So we're afraid to acknowledge how violent our culture is. I just showed this film in the Czech Republic. Teenagers were crying. They were like, I can't believe people are this mean to each other. And I was like, oh, what? This is just American high school. <laughs> it's like crazy. Like it was really shocking to me and it was so useful to be out of this. And so I think the larger idea also is like, just because we inherited this culture doesn't mean we have to perpetuate it. Just because this is all how we were raised and this is like very familiar and well, she did that and so that's what happened or you know, whatever doesn't, just because it's the norm now doesn't mean it has to stay that way. So I think that's another set of points. And I think, you know, what you were speaking to, it takes a lot of vulnerability too, to admit, admit your faults, admit what you've done wrong. I think, Mark, that is a big project of your podcast. It's not super flattering to like put it out in the world and be like, I went on a date with a woman who was super successful and that made me feel like shit. And what's that about? Like, what does that mean? Like, why does it hurt my sense of masculinity to like be around a woman who's feeling herself, you know? Like, can you speak to sort of, I feel like other men need help is sort of like a project of vulnerability of like what we're sort of calling people to do here. Well, especially with this, and I, again, I, I didn't grow up playing any sports in any real way. I was a terrible athlete. So I sort of self-selected out like, okay, I'll just, I'll, I'll hang out on the field doing something else. Um, but, I've, I've been very fascinated by, because I, I feel it too in different circumstances, there's such little boxes, these small boxes, and it feels like a few of them um, growing up as a boy that you're supposed to fit in and the threat of social isolation if you call anything out or if you become an other within that. And I, I really hope, you know, for, I don't have any kids currently, but I hope for my nieces and nephews that they, that this is progressing a little bit. Uh, with other men need help, and just what I've been really curious about, besides accountability, besides ownership, besides um, sort of pointing to the everyday actions that we're doing, is kind of quietly celebrating and archiving uh, male tenderness, which I think is the, my hope is, and I, I don't have any lofty goals with this project, I hope that people enjoy it, I hope that it's helpful in some way, but I think culturally, until you know, the work that I can do with people in my life, uh, my everyday people, my family, my friends, is that I can, I can create and hopefully create a chain of osmosis of, I don't want to say tenderness, but vulnerability and openness, because I think if the average man sees the average man taking actions, then that will start becoming the norm. And so things like this aren't as, things like this aren't as passive. The actions of, of active resistance or the actual act of calling something out will become almost instantaneous in a way. I mean, I just, I hope that that doesn't sound like blind optimism, but I really think that if really all of us can analyze a bit of what we're doing every day and just offer that as a, as a target of 
the people and especially the men in this room and every single man and boy we encounter some degree of osmosis that we can give off to them so that it just becomes completely every day that we are vulnerable, that we own our actions and that we call out things when they're wrong. The last thing I'll say is that if you take from this film that this is a football problem or a sports problem, you've missed it. This is not something that is specific to football. Like this is everywhere. This is our country. So if you are assuming that this doesn't happen in corporate America, it does. I work there, right? The Me Too movement is not about football. It's about the corporate system, right? So we just have to make sure that we're not trying to locate issues in certain places. The, the, the challenge of patriarchy and toxic masculinity and the fact that men don't know how to define manhood for themselves is a, is a universal issue. All right, I do want to give Film Forum their theater back, but I think just before uh, we go and continue the conversations with you guys, either over drinks or in the lobby, um, what is like one one thing that people can maybe even go home and do tonight? Like, we're, we've seen this film, we're all feeling a lot of feelings. Like, what is something that you can go home and do to feel like you're making a change? I'll speak to things I've been asking myself, but I'm, and I'm sorry, men in the audience, I'm going to target you, but I honestly, for, for men, I, I really think if we can all, if we can go home and just look at one thing, we all want to believe that we are disassociated from the terrible things that other men do or other people in this world do. We really do. But if we can just look at one thing and, and one action, just look at your day today and one part of it in which you can improve continuously. Like if you are making eye contact too long, if you are, uh, I think I mentioned this er earlier, but if culturally you are posting things that are mostly about male writers or male filmmakers or these sort of things, what are you putting out in the world or what are you participating in, in which you can make at least a small change starting tomorrow and continue that and again modeling that. And call me out too. That's what I'm going to ask everybody to do is that like call me out like you would somebody that's close to you if I'm not doing something that's modeling good behavior or modeling behavior that I'm trying to ask of you. Uh, the one thing that I would say to, to kind of dovetail that for the men in the room is to think of a time where you have made um, someone feel like the other own it. Own it publicly. Tell someone else about it. But then educate yourself to understand what the impact of that action was, not just on the other person, but on you. Because when you treat someone else like non-human, you also dehumanize your, yourself, right? So, and then take it one step further and, and figure out what are the forms of restitution that you have to pay that is never ending, right? If we could do that, then we start to model to other men what does it look like to show up in the world better. Well, women need improvement. It's not my job to tell women what to do. <laughs> no, no. Well, you guys can't, but I can. Um, well, go home and tell everyone that they should see this film. <laughs> and, you know, as a woman, I've done a lot of work, certainly, you know, trying to do better in terms of how we're acculturated in patriarchy as well, right? And as a white woman, um, what am I doing to, you know, solve, help, be less racist and owning my power as a white woman and white women we can see it all over Trump's administration are holding up this racist xenophobic administration, right? So if I, I can be a white lady and go to the Rust Belt and make this movie because people think that I am like them, right? So that's, that's when I realize I have to use that privilege to do that. But how am I benefiting every day um, and what can I do about that? So. Awesome. Well, you have the movie's information. It's Roll Red Roll. It's going to be playing here a few more nights. Uh, I believe it's hashtag RR Film. No, oh, I think it's Roll Red Roll Doc, but I think okay. the stuff's up here. Oh. Yeah, it's Yeep. all up there, so we don't have to think. Yeah, tell... <laughs> tell everybody about it some like something i've been telling people is i feel like this is requisite viewing for just being a human being um so thank you guys for being human beings tonight Fun. thank you for listening to film forum presents special thanks to together films for making this event possible if you like what you just heard please be sure to subscribe to get future episodes and rate and review so that more movie lovers can find us film forum is an independent non-profit cinema and our doors have been kept open for nearly 50 years thanks to the invaluable support of our members and donors. 
please visit www.filmforum.org for details on membership, as well as information and showtimes for our current programming. See you at the movies.